You're listening to the Weekend Sport Podcast with Jason Pine from Newstalk ZB. Now a chance, Sotoyalo passes away beautifully for Dan Carter. Carter kick and chase and Carter scores! What a brilliant try for Dan Carter. Oh, beautiful kick. How can a man have such poise, such mental toughness to score a spectacular try and then calmly slot a goal from the most difficult position? Yeah, one of the absolute greats. This week, All Blacks legend Dan Carter launched Beat Dan Carter in partnership with UNICEF Aotearoa. The campaign invites you to kick one ball from one tee for one hour to raise money to help children across the Pacific get access to clean water. All money raised will go to the DC-10 Fund, directly supporting UNICEF's water, sanitation and hygiene program for children in the Pacific, where sanitation-related diseases are one of the leading causes of death for under fives, particularly in some of the hardest-to-reach places. Dan Carter, who is also a UNICEF ambassador, kicked it off, literally, on Tuesday by setting the challenge target, 273. That's about one kick every 13 seconds for an hour. We'll give you some details shortly on how you can get involved and try to beat Dan Carter, but the man himself is with us. Great to chat to you, Dan. How do you feel about the 273 that you kicked the other day in one hour as a target for other people to chase? Oh, I, I, I would have taken that at the start of the day, to be honest. I wasn't too sure. I was going into the unknown a little bit. All through the school holidays recently, I was... I was out there practicing, had all my kids out there returning my kicks for me. They were absolutely sick of it by the end of the school holidays. And, you know, they say don't run a marathon before the marathon. So I, I didn't kick for one hour, but I got up to 50 minutes and I got I got just under 200. Um, so I thought I might be just over 200. So to get to 273 was was pretty good. I, I had some, um, some future stars of uh, our games and... Um, boys and girls uh, returning the kicks uh, for me and they did a fantastic job which which meant I was able to kick uh, 273 kicks in an hour which which I was pleased with but I think it's it's beatable it's definitely beatable all right it's a it's a terrific target I, I would have been telling the uh, the helpers to slow down a bit because <laughs> 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 so, hey, every 13 seconds for an hour that's um I mean how was the body afterwards yeah the hammies were a bit tight and uh, and the hip flexor as well but uh Honestly, what what gets you through is is the fact that you're you're doing it for a good cause, and and I've been lucky enough to be over get over to the Pacific Islands and and see the impact that uh, the donations are having uh, on these children over in the in the in the Pacific Islands. So uh, I'm not sure if you remember, but two years ago I did uh, a 24 hour kickathon where mm. I kicked goals for 24 hours at Eden Park, and we raised um, just over half a million dollars and. And I've been over to the Pacific twice since then, and just to see these uh, these facilities, uh, bathrooms that were put into these schools, medical centres now have access to, to clean water, um, and it really is life changing stuff. So I'm getting a bit older now. Don't think I can kick for 24 hours, and I thought, right, let's uh, let's get other people kicking instead of me. <laughs> so I thought I can I can kick for an hour, and now I've left the challenge over um, to the rest of New Zealand to to try and take me on, and and you can challenge me individually or you can actually get a team, a group of you to, to try and take me on as well so if, if you're looking at entering, maybe round up a few mates to, to help you share the workload a little bit. Uh, fair enough too uh, we'll give the uh, the details on how people can do that shortly. What is it about this particular cause though that resonates with you? Yeah, I mean, I've been an ambassador uh, with UNICEF since 2016 I've seen the incredible work that they do all over the world for, for underprivileged children and I always wanted to do more but I never could with my rugby playing schedule um, but having retired from the game three years ago gave me a chance to to be able to finally do more so that's why I set up the DC10 fund I partnered with UNICEF and then I wanted to to pick a, a project that really hit home uh, in, in, in my heart and, and once I learned around um, you know the Pacific Islands, you know, our neighbouring brothers and sisters, a place that we often go and holiday to, um, a huge part of the the rugby community, uh, you know, Pacific Islanders, some of my teammates and um, guys I played against, you know, grew up in, in the Pacific Islands. And once I learned that 
actually one of the, the leading causes of death for, for children in Pacific Island under the age of five was the fact that they didn't have access to, to clean water, something we, we take for granted you know, here in, in New Zealand, but I knew that that was the project that I really wanted to, to support. And then since going over there and, and seeing the impact that it's having on these children, they're, they're starting to go to school more, they're looking forward to going to school because they have... Um, you know, drinking water. They have their bathrooms at the school, uh, the medical centres, and the work that we're doing, um, and then building uh, water infrastructures there to to be able to, you know, to give uh, clean water to to the medical centres is, is something you know really really is life changing. So, um, yeah, as much fun as this big Dan Carter event is, it's the the most important thing is is you get in behind it and you get out fundraising. So. You know, go talk to your your family, your friends, your communities to to sponsor you um, to to try and try and beat my target of of two hundred and seventy three kicks. How important uh, is it to you? Was it to you as you were coming towards the end of your elite playing career to involve yourself in something that you had a real connection to? Yeah, well, I think it was it's because I became a father myself, mm. and you know, you, you see the life that that your children have, and um, you know. And then having to be some to some of these UNICEF field trips um, and to see how little a lot of children have uh, around the world, and you know they still continue to to smile, laugh, have fun. Um, you know, every time I go to a field trip, I always take a rugby ball, and and they just their faces just light up. You know, when they get to to play, and um, you know, so I'm extremely grateful that that rugby, you know, has been a big part of providing. Um, you know, the life that my family and I get to live in and, and understand that not all, all children you know, get that freedom. So, um, it's, you know, it's great to, to be able to use sort of my platform and, um, you know, fan base to, to be able to help advocate and, and raise much needed funds for, for these children in need. Just on the goal kicking, um, you know, I'm sure you don't do this, but when you put a, a, a Google search in uh, for your name, most, or not most, but a lot of the images that come up are of you kicking goals, preparing to kick a goal, that sort of thing. When you were playing, how much of your time did you devote specifically to goal kicking? Uh, a lot, but not as much um, as I did when I was a kid. So I grew up, and as soon as I could walk, I was kicking goals, or trying to kick goals, kicking the ball. My dad was trying to teach me as soon as I could walk. And so it's always been a big part of my life. And as soon as school finished, I'd race back home, and I'd be kicking goals until it got dark. So I was kicking every single day. So I think the reason that I was able to you know, have a, a successful uh, rugby career and, and score lots of uh, conversions and kick lots of penalties was because of the work that I did as a kid it's not like I was having to do hours and hours each day when I was playing because you know I'd I'd overwork myself but the work had had already been done before I started playing professionally so when I was playing professionally yes I was often the last one on the training field you know kicking goals Um, but I always did it because because I loved it Um, but that's how I sort of fine-tuned you know the the skill set of being able to kick goals was was on the backyard at home, and that's why you know I really encourage um, people you know to sign up to this campaign and, and get outdoors and just just kick a ball around. And if you do sign up and have some success in, in the fundraising side of of this campaign, you know there's kicking tees, there's balls uh, to be won. Um, I'm actually going to to pick some some winners as well, where I'm going to go visit them and take them for a kicking session, whether that's a school or a rugby club. Um, uh, we'll, we'll soon see who wins those competitions. There's a lot of incentives to to basically just get outside, uh, fundraise for a really good cause, and and you know kick a few goals and have a bit of fun with it. You know, not everyone can kick a ball over the post uh, from a kicking tee, and and I'm I'm not sort of restricting them if they can't, if they want to just get a ball and kick it out of their hand over the post and count how many they can do and get people to sponsor them to do that for an hour, then then that's fine as well. So I'm pretty relaxed about the. Um, you know the, the the rules of of the the competition, but more focused on you know making sure you get outside, have some fun, and you know fundraise for a really good cause along the way. Yeah, it feels like a uh, something which is accessible to a lot of people. Uh, so when you when you became like a 
when you became a professional rugby player, how different did your kicking process become? Because clearly you weren't kicking goals at All Blacks level the same way, you know, an eight-year-old Dan Carter was in the backyard. When did you when did you really refine your process and how much did it change over the years? Yeah, well, I've always been able to kick goals, but when you start kicking in front of you know, tens of thousands of people, it's it's a completely different uh, ball game. And I'll never forget my my first professional game of rugby for the Crusaders against the Hurricanes in 2003. And for some reason, Andrew Murden started me ahead of Andrew Murden. Uh, sorry, Robbie Dean started me ahead of Andrew Murden, my childhood hero. Um, so he was on the bench. Here I am at uh, the old Lancaster Park, 30, 40,000 people watching me wondering why the hell am I kicking and starting in the number 10 Crusaders jersey ahead of Andrew Murdens. I froze, I freaked out. My first two kicks, I missed. And they were from right in front, about 30 metres out. It was so embarrassing um, because I was slotting them all week. Um, so I learned once I started playing professionally around the, the mindset and the routine and actually having to work on that that routine and structure that you have with every kick that you take, whether it's a training, whether it's in a game, or whether it's to to uh, win a Rugby World Cup, there needs to be a set routine to help you control your mind because often you can think about the outcome or the things that are putting you off. And um, and that's something that I learned playing professionally. It's, it's one thing being able to kick, but it's, it's another thing being able to control that pressure um, and, and kick in, in those high pressurised uh, situations and I learned that pretty early in my career and had some good people alongside me to help me but I think that was learning, getting that learning early in my career was a big uh, reason why I was able to, you know, to kick a few goals uh, after that uh, that, uh, that awful uh, debut that I had. <laughs> I look at the stats at the moment, I think Damian McKenzie's the best of the New Zealand goal kickers this Super Rugby season, he's kicking uh, at around 84%. Um, do you think he'd be pretty happy with that? Is that sort of 80, 85% uh, a satisfactory percentage for goal kickers at, at the top level? Yeah, absolutely. Anything over 80% uh, you'd, you'd be happy with. So um, the fact that he's high 80s is, you know, that's uh, yeah, that's sort of world-class standard. So um, he'd, be, he'd be happy with that. Um, but in saying that, most kickers are never happy. <laughs> You're always wanting to, uh, to search for perfection and, and I'm sure he can count on all, all the uh, the misses that he's had this year and uh, be annoyed by those and, and you know constantly you know seeking perfection and perfection's 100 percent that's what you're striving for but um, as someone that's played the game long enough you know I'd be happy with it with those stats so he's, he's obviously striking the ball pretty well do you think he's got the inside running for the all blacks 10 jersey yeah, I think so. You know, with, with Bodie playing over in, in Japan um, on on sabbatical, uh, you know, you, you'd think so. His form far out. It's uh, he's, he's on fire. Obviously, you just talked about his kicking stats, but his just his general play. He's been around the All Black environment for a while now, so he, he's got that uh, that experience. The only thing he's sort of lacking is actually he hasn't sort of steered the ship. Um, you know. Taken the that leadership role because you always had the likes of Bodie and, and Richie there, but I, you know it's, it's, uh, he, he's ready to go. You got Bodie coming back. Um, there just hasn't been a younger player sort of really step up at uh, the super at uh, this stage of Super Rugby level to go. Hey Razor, you should be picking me ahead of um, Damien McKenzie and uh, and Bodie. So um, there's plenty of talent out there, but the the form that that, that uh, Damien sort of Take it into this uh, this campaign. You'd like to think that that's given them the yeah the the inside running, but uh, you know we'll wait and see. Still plenty of rugby ahead of us. Your old team, the Crusaders, they've tried a few there this season. David Havili, they've landed on him. How do you assess his ability to play first five? Yeah, no, he's he's such a naturally talented player, and I'm actually really excited to see him slot into the you know the number ten jersey and. Um, you know, having sort of Lee Halfpenny to be able to kick goals really helps, even though Davy can strike a ball extremely well from long distances. Um, it gives you that reassurance to have someone like Davy. Uh, um, he, he just he just does the basics so well over and over again, and that's what you often need from a number 10 to, to direct the team around the field and, and do your your core uh, skills well and, and he'll be able to do that and you know there's plenty of talent outside of him as well so um, 
yeah, I'm really intrigued and, and excited to, to see how Dave goes in the number 10. You know, I don't think it's his preferred position, but you know, you've know, you got some pretty talented players uh, playing around you as well, and um, you're confident it's that's the, you know, the, the best, uh, you know, I guess, uh, you know, a good player to, to have uh, in, the, in that jersey um, this week. Dan, great to chat to you. Uh, terrific um, initiative, this uh, Beat Dan Carter. We'll give out the details shortly and, and get them up online so as many people as possible uh, can get involved. Um, so 24 hours down to one hour. So in, what, in, a, in a couple of years, are we talking about a 10-minute kick on or something like that? Oh, geez, yeah. Like I said, I'm not getting any younger, so maybe one minute. One minute, I think I can do it a minute. Uh, thank you so much for your support. Really appreciate it. No, great to chat to you, Dan. Thanks indeed. Dan Carter there. Uh, here's how it works, the Beat Dan Carter Challenge. Good to chat to Dan Carter too. Love his insights into the 10 position. Uh, we'll get to that and your thoughts in a moment. But you can sign up at beatdancarter.com. Now, you can do it as an individual or a team and take part in the Beat Dan Carter Challenge. It's going to run between June 3 and 17. So it's next month um, is when you can get involved in it. You need to kick one ball from one tee for one hour. And then you just ask your friends, your family, your neighbours, anybody else to sponsor you per kick or with a general donation for giving it a go. And all of those funds raised go to uh, you know a terrific cause, as you heard Dan outline. It's a cause close to his heart, helping children across the Pacific get access to clean water through UNICEF. Now, anyone who signs up, you get top training tips from Dan Carter himself uh, during the training and the fundraising period, and uh, teams and individuals that raise the most could get a coaching clinic from Dan Carter. As you heard him mention there, he's going to head out to schools or clubs or whatever it might be and give some coaching clinics, plus lots of other prizes up for grabs as well. Adidas Rugby Balls and other things. BeatDanCarter.com is where you'll find all the details. Great uh, pleasure to chat to the man himself. Your thoughts are welcome on anything you heard there. 0800 80 1080. The David Havili issue really, really interests me. As soon as it was revealed that his move to the 10 jersey for the Crusaders was, in part anyway, prompted by All Blacks coach Scott Robertson, David Harvey went from being, I guess what you could describe as a squad all black, to, in the words of some people I heard this week, an irresistible all blacks proposition. Now, I feel like I, I need to see how he goes at first five first before I make that sort of assessment. David Harvey, clearly a very, very good rugby player, but I've never seen him play first five for any length of time. All of his test starts have been at second five. He might have gone into first receiver on occasion, but most of what I've seen from David Havili has been in the 12 jersey, and he's been bloody good there. Now, we obviously have to defer to the inside knowledge here of Razor, who worked for years with David Havili at the Crusaders and knows what he is capable of. He never had to play first five at the Crusaders before because Richie Moonga was always there, and when he wasn't, Fergus Burke stepped in to play in that position. Almost all of Havili's Super Rugby up until now has been at 12, so I am very interested to see how he goes at 10, because the other thing you hear coming out of Crusaders country all the time from the playing group is just how intelligent a rugby player David Havili is. They all just rave about the man about his rugby IQ and his ability to do all sorts of things with a rugby ball. There's also plenty of talk about his versatility and adding 10 as a string to his bow, how that would be an advantage for the All Blacks, which of course is true. Being able to play in more than one position is obviously very helpful, but I don't know. Does David Havili make the best All Blacks 23? I think the best 10-12-13 combo is Damien McKenzie, Jordy Barrett and Rico Ioane. More on him in a moment because he took a fearful head knock last night. But that's the best 10, 12, 13, isn't it? Mackenzie, Barrett, Ioane. So maybe David Havili is part of the back reserves. But there's probably only one spot available there because you've got a reserve halfback. A reserve who can play sort of in the outside backs. And then your midfield cover, which for a long time has been Anton Leonard Brown because he so competently covers both 12 and 13. So maybe David Havili takes that position because he can cover 12 
presumably 13. I've never seen him play at centre either. And now first five. But I would still like to see him play at first five <laughs> a couple of times. I mean, he'll probably have an absolute stormer this afternoon. 0800 80 10 80. Be keen to know um, what you've seen, uh, particularly in Crusaders country. Um, and Damien McKenzie is still the All Blacks first five, isn't he? You look around and there isn't really anyone else unless Razor decides Bowden Barrett is his man, fresh back from Japan and with no Super Rugby under his belt. That seems unlikely. Stephen Pettifetta, unfortunately, hasn't been able to play for the last three or four weeks through injury. So it, it, it almost has to be Damien McKenzie. For more from Weekend Sport with Jason Pine, listen live to News Talk ZB weekends from midday or follow the podcast on iHeartRadio.